All right. Now, the next illustration is something that comes up in combinatorial mathematics, computer science, and engineering all the time. You're trying to count a set of objects, call them good. But if you want to count the good objects, it might be easier to first count all the <coughs> objects. Then if you can count the bad ones, well, the good ones are the total minus the bad. And so that's the trick we're going to use here. We're going to get the whole, then we're going to identify the bad ones, take the bad ones away, and we're left with the good ones. So now the problem is how many integer solutions in non-negative integers to the equation x1, x2, x3, x4, subject to these constraints, x1 and x2 are greater than or equal to 0. x3 is in the window between 2 and 5. And x4 is positive. So here's the way I'd like to tackle that problem. I want to see this as two problems. And I'm going to work two problems which are similar in nature. And then I'm going to subtract the small one from the big one. So first, let's work the problem. If I have x1 and x2 greater than or equal to 0, and then my second constraint is only that x3 is greater or equal to 2. x3 greater or equal to 2. Forget about the 5. Can we work that? That's just what we just did, isn't it? That's what we just did. All right. Now, I'll probably, probably this answer is wrong again. I'm on a roll this morning. And uh, so let's, there's nothing for me to do except take my medicine and, and just work through it. Okay, what do we do? We add artificial variable, or artificial object for x1 and x2. So that takes 63 up to 65. All right, now for x3, we want x3 to be greater than or equal to 2. So we make a set aside. How big is that set aside? Just one. Just one. Because if we give something and have a set aside of one, then you'll be greater than or equal to two. All right, so we went from 63 up to 65. Okay, but now we set aside, we're back to 64. And so you can see that the term on the left should not be 64 choose three, it should be 63 choose three. The same, you know, it's, math is like that. that once you start making mistakes, you just do it over and over again. So that should be 63 choose 3 on the left. That's the total. Now, what I'm going to do is subtract from that the number which violate the condition that x3 is at most 5. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to work the problem that has these constraints, x1, x2 greater than or equal to 0, x3 bigger than 5, and x4 positive. We can do that. That's just the kind of problem we've just been doing. So you have two artificial objects, one for x1 and one for x2. That takes 63 up to 65. Then you make a set aside for x3. We're working the problem that x3 is bigger than 5, so we make a set aside of 5. So the 65 now reduces to 60. And then we subtract 1 to get 59. Now, why I did this one right and the other one wrong, that's for you to figure out. Uh, OK, again. So I was asked to explain the second part again. We're trying to count the ones which are bad. Now, they're bad because we're going to make x3 bigger than 5. 
So if we take off the ones where x3 is bigger than 5, then we're left with the ones where x2 is in between 2 and 5, and that's what we want. So we're now defining bad. Bad means you're okay for all of them except x3 is too large. x3 is bigger than 5. So how do we do that? We take 63 objects. We increase to 64 and then 65 by adding one imaginary one for x1 and one for x2. Then we do a set aside for x3. We do a set aside by setting aside 5. And that takes the 65 back down to 60. Then we divide the 60 into the four bins with all bins being positive. So we take 59, choose 3. <laughs> then we take away 1 from, take away 1 from 1, take away 1 from 2 to get to their actual totals, which could be 0. All right, so that's, those are the bad ones. So we take the all minus the bad to get to the good. That's kind of cute, isn't it? Kind of cute. So it's all reducing it back to the same basic problem, but with some bells and whistles along the way. Let me comment that if you check the test archive, you will see that there are problems like this on every test one since the beginning of time. And they're there with solutions, and some of the solutions, sometimes for ordinary tests, I just write solutions like a solution key. And sometimes I write expanded explanations of the solution with a header at the top that says, this is much more information than I'm expecting students to provide in answering these questions on a test. But if you look over those and, and work through a couple of them, you will see, you will get this drift of this problem. It's very, very standard kind of stuff. But what does that mean? You will get it on test one. Promise. Promise there will be a question like this on test one. 